All right, so as we look at data, it's very interesting. If you've looked at your course offerings over the course of um, the next couple days, you know, you realize it's really multifaceted. At one time, whenever we thought about, you know, data integration and what data means, it was very singular focused. It was, you know, just taking all these points and either plotting them or listing them and, and using them to make one-time decisions. But one of the things that we've learned in education is that data is absolutely multifaceted. From simple aspects of data, simple measurements of data, thumbs up, thumbs down, to hashtags, to much more robust systems of data in terms of student accounting, um, teacher alignment, in terms of resource allocation. So we know that what we've learned in this field of education and how it relates to data has become so much more complex. And not only in our professional lives, but also in our personal lives. You know, I think about once you started to really learn uh, about the use of data and the impact of data, it really tends to, and, and you know, full disclaimer, um, you know, as a teacher, I taught English language learners. Um, as an administrator, I worked, you know, both in Philadelphia and in Lancaster, and I am a self-described data geek. I mean, I, before data walls were, you know, were in vogue, I had, you know, my sheets of paper up, which were absolutely horrible rudimentary, you know, data walls. They were just lines on a piece of paper, how kids, you know, how my students were doing at the high school. And then even as a superintendent, continue to, to really focus and drive discussions based on that wall. So it wasn't a surprise to me when my son, who was in second grade at, at the time, came home, and he's now, just to kind of give you um, you know, how long ago in this evolution of data it was. He's now in sixth grade. So when he was in second grade, he started engaging in reading centers. So his teacher broke students down into small guided reading groups. And I remember him coming home and sharing with me. He says, you know, Dad, he goes, I, I had my one-on-one -on -one reading time with the teacher, and my, she told me my fluency was in the 95th percentile. He said, that's pretty good, right? I said, that's great. She goes, but I struggled a little bit in, in fluency. I said, well, you know, what's, you know, so first I wanted to see if he really knew what he was talking about or just trying to impress his dad. I said, so what's fluency? He goes, well, that's how I can flow from word to word and how quickly I can share the words in the book. And I said, so what was your fluency level? But he said, well, you know, I was at, at 48, uh, you know, words a minute. I said, well, I said, that's something that you can practice on. The good news is you know what you're reading, fluency you can practice on. He goes, but I noticed there were some other kids in my class that were reading over 100 words a minute. He goes, and dad, I want to get to 100 words a minute, second grader. And so I looked at him and I said, so what are you going to do? He said, well, the teacher helped me create this little bar graph. And he had, you know, the sheet of paper with a bar graph that was at 48. And he colored it in. And, and he goes, and this is where I want to be. So every night when I come home, I'm going to, I'm going to use your phone. And I'm going to time my, I'm going to turn on the stopwatch. First, I just thought he wanted to play Angry Birds or, or something. But no, he, he did use the stopwatch a little. Um, I'm going to use my phone. I'm going to, you know, count. I'm going to measure how quickly I can read through, you know, through passages. So I thought this was a phase, you know, second grade, you know, he, he's a typical boy. Trust me, you see him. Um, he would much rather be outside riding bike or, um, you know, exercising his thumbs on a video game than, you know, calculating how quickly he can work through fluency. But every night for the better, for the better part of a month, including weekends, my son came home and for a half hour to an hour every day, timed himself in terms of his reading fluency. And then he took this bar graph and he continued to create these bars and, you know, color them in and, um, you know, and he kind of, and he taped them to his wall so he can measure his own progress. And I was like, look at this, you know, he's turning into a, ge a data geek like his dad. He has his own data wall up on the wall. But and I didn't say a word. I'd walk by and, you know, whenever he was either into, you know, taking a shower or outside playing with his friends and, you know, analyze his data wall and take little notes, you know, being the dad that I was, and uh, walk away whenever I heard him coming anywhere near. I said, like, let me get out of here before, you know, because the moment I notice and compliment him, it's not cool anymore. He'll stop doing it. So, you know, in the course of those few months, he went from 48 words a minute to 128 words a minute. All because, and, and granted, he had an amazing teacher and he did some great work in the classroom. But it was amazing that through the use of data and through focus, he created a goal for himself. And he worked every day and measured himself every day, you know, to, to try to attain that goal. And he wasn't the only one. He had some little buddies that were doing it as well from his school. But I thought to myself, as, as I saw him, you know, progress, I thought to myself, see, that's the power of the use of data. 
And as we look through our um, agenda and the opportunities that we're going to have, we see it's so much more than just a computerized system. Data is about creating logical expectations. Data is about creating goals that could be attained, but also establishing benchmarks towards attainment of those goals. So when you think about what you do, and I know this is probably one of the, uh, you know, as I, as I meet and we get to speak, um, you know, throughout the Commonwealth with data teams, you're, you're one of the most, um, I was going to say underrepresented, although with the past few years with reductions being made, you definitely are underrepresented. But you're one of the most underappreciated groups, you know, in, in some of our school districts because you're the folks that come in and say, well, the data says, See, and when you're a leader like me, you like to come in and paint the big rosy picture and say, you know, we are doing great. And do I say if I show a five-point gain or a 35% point gain, you know, what's better? And, you know, the data folks are saying, well, you know, if you want to be statistically accurate, I say, no, 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 I just want to tell a good story, right? You know, if you're, those of you who work with superintendents and, you know, principals, you know you just want to tell a good story. But you're the individuals that really not only just calculate and identify and align data, you're the folks that help create a culture of excellence and a culture of change. So I'm going to stop there so you can really start to think about this. Because in the Department of Ed and throughout the Commonwealth, as we're connecting with stakeholders, as we're connecting with community leaders, as we're connecting with our legislator and the General Assembly, we're always asking for more resources for education. We're always asking to the opportunity to put more supplies and to put more educators and to put more members of a team and to give greater alignment to our school districts. So think about what you do and how it aligns to that action. I'm being purposeful in saying action. So without data, and that was a purposeful pause, by the way. I didn't forget what I was going to say. So without data, those investments are just a cost. Now, if I start to align data-driven goals and expectations, guess what? The conversation has just moved from the cost of education to the investment in education. Because when you take a resource and you align it to a measurable goal, Guess what? You've now turned that vision, that mission into a goal, into an investment. And when you take some action, some place you just want to be, whether it's moving from 48 words a minute to, you know, 128 words a minute or whatever number you're, you know, the students are trying to reach, and you know that you're measuring progress throughout the course of that journey, of, of that, uh, you know, of that transfer, you know, of knowledge, you just taken very simple action in some cases and made it strategic improvement. Because all in all, what it allows you to do by being really intentional and smart about how you pull and how you align and how you assess data, you move from just kind of a journey to taking a much more strategic journey by taking a path that's going to lead to not only improvement of our children and teaching and learning, but the improvement of our institutions of learning, of our system of learning, of the statewide system of learning. Which is why what you're doing here today, why you all are engaging together and really um, you know, discussing this aspect of not only data, but how we collect data, how we use data, when you're looking at you know, an infrastructure to, to best support it, um, you know, the, the information that you're bringing in and you're pushing out, you know, you're going to be discussing how you can communicate you know, the data being, you know, being shared and, and why it's important and how to make it relevant in terms of this movement. Know that what you do goes so far beyond just sitting in a small office or a cubicle, or, you know, or sharing space with a bunch of other individuals and typing away on a computer. What you're doing is helping to lead a strategic vision for the institutions you serve whether it's at the state level, whether it's at the intermediate unit level, whether it's at a school district, whether it's at a traditional public school, 
or a charter school, folks who are in independent schools and private schools who are now using data to really drive um, instructional change, you know, are really starting to, to see how important this alignment is. So know that, no, you're not collectors of data. Know that, you know, you're not just, uh, you know, a, a simple little cog in the wheel of, you know, of, of providing a resource to a school district or to a community of learners. What you are is you're an important part of creating a strategic vision for the institution you're serving, for whoever it is that you're representing. Because one of the things that we've learned through this evolution of data, it's not just an afterthought. It should be one of the first aspects that we look at to not only improve systems, but to change a culture. And that's an interesting last aspect that I wanted to share with you. So when you come together, and we're really going to be having technical conversations over the course of the next few days, so what does data have to do with changing culture? A lot, a lot. Folks believe that you can just sometimes walk into a room and tell folks to believe that we can change the lives of kids each and every day and it's going to happen. Sometimes we really try to do it. I mean, sometimes we walk into a building and we say, you know, the beatings will continue until morale improves, right? It's not how it works. I tried it at home, and I hate when my wife beats me until I, my morale improves. It doesn't work that way. I try to tell her it doesn't work that way, but she doesn't listen. It doesn't work that way. You know how we change belief? We put a system in place. We put action in place. We measure how well that action is improving the, you know, the quality of instruction, if it's an instructional culture you're trying to engage in. We measure how well our students are doing, how well our teachers are doing as in relation to that change, and then folks start to believe. And guess what? You can't do it once. It's a rotation. You put an action in place, you measure it, you share outcomes. When they're positive outcomes, more people buy in. You put an action in place, you measure it, you share outcomes, more folks will buy in. You put an action in place, you measure it, and that's where data comes to play. That's where strategic information comes to play when you're changing a culture. And if you don't believe me, try it. Those leaders in this room, instead of just proclamating what you're going to do over the course of the next school year, because we're rounding out this school year, Share some specific data points and share with everyone on the team how you're going to strategically address each one of those two or three points. And then over the course of the year, share the data that supports your claim. Share the data that supports your investment. And more and more and more individuals will buy in. Now, we also know that we have to have the proper use you know, of data because quite often, you know, especially in this age of technology, um, everyone has access to all kinds you know, of information. I mean, if you wanted to find, there are at least 10 websites out there that will, um, in which you can look up your school districts or look up the state and will give you a reflection of whether you're, do, you're doing really, really well or you're doing poorly. So I think this is where we really start to get into the, the need for consistency around data and information. Because we know that if you're not consistent with that data and you're not, telling your, not using data to tell your story, someone else is going to tell your story. And in this age of social media and this age you know, of, of community involvement in this age of us being more part of a global community, this is extremely or especially important because we know that if you're not telling your story, those who have had a negative experience and, and see that information are seven times more likely to share that experience than someone who, who's had a positive experience, right? We know that if you've been at a, you know, at a school level and you're hanging out in the playground, that one parent who shows up and stands outside in the periphery if they're not right inside and has had a negative experience, they usually try to attract the crowd as large as they can. And those that have had a positive experience are usually right in the mix with everyone else, 
really enjoying uh, you know, their experience at the school. So the beauty of telling, of using data to really create that story or to create that narrative does a number of things. One is you can tell folks, if, don't take it from me. If you don't believe me, look at the data. Secondly, those folks that like to usually tell, uh, you know, especially in, in relation to schools, who like to share that in, the negative information with seven folks, change their story every time. It's like, you know, that teacher shared a really rude word you know, with me, said, wait. And the teacher may have said, hold on, but the teacher said, wait. Then the second person comes around and he says, that teacher said, wait. And then the third person is, can you tell that, you, can you believe that teacher told me to shut up? You know, it's amazing how that story escalates, right? So if they ever say that I've shared, you know, negative, that I've, you know, communicated negatively with anyone, they're lying. Don't, don't believe a word they say. <laughs> but we know how those stories escalate. So when you're using this culture, when you're establishing this expectation and this alignment of data to create your district's or your school's narrative, you have a resource that supports what it is that you're sharing. And make sure that we understand our consumer nowadays is so much more sophisticated than they once were. Once were. So if you share data, you share this information through the use of social media, or through the use of parent meetings, or through the use of community meetings, more likely than not, they will understand exactly what it is that you're sharing. So as for us at the Department of Education, as we've been really working very, very hard to change the face of education across the Commonwealth, to be the biggest advocate out there in education, to really celebrate the work that we're doing each and every day in our schools and in our communities. As we've been saying, and I like to share, you know, our job is to ensure our kids are better the day they leave us than they were the day they started. How we prove that is through the work that you do each and every day. And when we meet with the members of the General Assembly and I convince and I try my best to convince them that this investment of education is exactly that, an investment in education, and here's the data that shows what investment does, what we are able to accomplish with an investment, and unfortunately what we're also able to show is what happens when you don't invest in education and what the data looks like. The work you do is extremely important. As we visit schools and we share these successes across the Commonwealth and parents tell us, my kids are learning to read, and here's why, and our children are doing better in math, and here's why, and our, you know, we look at attendance and some of the measures we're looking to update and create around the school performance profile that will require much of your work is going to lead to not only a transformation in the investment of education, but a transformation in the future of education in the Commonwealth. Because moving away from this cookie cutter approach of standardized tests to measure everything, even those things that aren't, you know, needed or should not be measured through standardized tests is going to require this audience. When we look to measure success in education much more holistically, when we look to tell the real story about teaching and learning, when we look to explain to folks and to advocate why the investment is needed, know that what you do each and every day you, the unsung heroes in our school districts and schools and agencies are the folks that provided the information for us to tell our story. And with your help, our story is going to change from this deficit model of investments to education to a true investment and life-changing opportunity for our children, their families, and our communities. So over the course of the next few days, know that you're not just coming together to learn more about numbers and process procedures. You're coming together to find new ways to improve the quality of life for those we are entrusted to care, our children. And you, our leaders of today, are investing in, you're focusing in, and preparing our leaders of tomorrow. So thank you very much for your time this morning, and thank you very much for changing the lives of the children of the Commonwealth. Have a great rest of the day.